once you've got the body in place to meditate, the real work lies in getting the mind in place. Actually, though, getting it in place is not that hard. You just focus on the breath. You know when the breath is coming in, know when it's going out. If you're going to think, think about the breath. It's okay to think in the meditation as long as the thinking deals with the breath, deals with your object, because you've got to evaluate it. Because that's what makes it easier to do the long work, which is not only getting the mind in place, but also keeping it in place. Because the nature of the mind is to keep wandering off. It's like a small child that's attracted by anything at all, a bright light, pretty colors, pretty sounds, and it goes right there. And sometimes that's dangerous, I and mean, this is how children get kidnapped, and this is how they get run over in the street. They're attracted by something, just go running after it without looking right or left, or looking at who's giving them the candy. Or they just go for whatever's attractive, whatever captures their attention. So to keep this child at home, you've got to give it toys to play with. So play with the breath. You can try long breathing, short breathing, deep breathing, shallow breathing, heavy or light breathing, fast or slow. Think of the breath as a whole body process. In other words, you don't focus simply on the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the nose, but any part of the body where there's any sense of movement, any sense of energy flow. You can focus on that and adjust the rhythm and texture of the breath so it feels really good right there. It feels very gratifying to breathe in, gratifying to breathe out. In this way, as the child of the mind has good things to play with, it's not going to go wandering off so easily. It can get absorbed right here. In this way, it stays at home. When it stays at home, it's safe. So we're giving the mind a good, secure place to stay, because it needs it. There are dangers around, not only dangers coming from outside, also dangers coming up from within the mind itself. Greed, anger, and delusion, those are the big ones. Sometimes we seem to think that greed is sparked by something outside, or anger is sparked by something outside. But there are often times when the mind is simply in the mood to be greedy, and then it goes looking for something worthy of its greed. Sometimes it wants to be angry, and it goes out looking something for something worthy of its anger. So the mind needs protection from those things, and part of its protection is having a good, comfortable place to stay right here. So that when these things come bubbling up out of the mind, you can see them clearly for what they are. You can see the anger arise, you can see where it's going, and you can foresee what's going to happen if you follow it. And if you realize you've got a better place to stay right now, then it's a lot easier to resist the anger. You simply don't have to follow through with it. Just breathe right through the anger. In other words, the physical symptoms that go along with the anger. And you find that it loses a lot of its power. In other words, you're occupying more of the body. You're more at home in the body. You're not giving it over to these alien forces that can cause you harm. The Buddha talks about developing mindfulness immersed in the body. And the image is of the mind total, 
the body totally saturated with your mindfulness from the head to the toe. When mindfulness occupies the body in this way, then other things that would come in that create disturbances have a harder time getting in. And in this way you're more protected, you're safer. You're less likely to do things under their power, things that you'd later regret. Because the purpose of the meditation is not only to give you a comfortable place to stay in the present, although that is one of the purposes, but it's also to put you in a good, solid position so that when unskillful thoughts come up in the mind, you're less likely to go for them, because you've got something better, a better place to stay. You're, you're in a position of strength, less likely to get knocked over. And you're developing two important qualities for, to protect the mind, mindfulness and alertness. Mindfulness means keeping things in mind. In other words, you can remember. Okay, if you act on anger, it's going to cause problems. If you act on greed, it's going to cause problems. If you act on lust or delusion, it's going to cause problems. You've got to keep that in mind, because so many times we like to forget it. Anger comes along and we very conveniently forget the last time we were angry, the last time we gave in to the anger, and what we said and did and how much we regretted it later. The mind puts up a wall because it, it wants to act on the anger. But when your mindfulness is really solid and continuous, it's harder to put up that wall. And when you learn to associate a sense of ease and well-being with the mindfulness, then it's a lot easier to keep the wall from getting coming up. Because a lot of the reason we go for these things like anger and greed and lust and whatever is the immediate sense of gratification. As the Buddha once said, you can't really abandon unskillful thoughts in the mind until you see both the gratification that comes from them and the drawbacks. Once you admit, say, that there is the gratification from acting on anger, you could look at it and compare it to the sense of ease and well-being that comes from being mindful and alert. And as your powers of observation get more and more refined, you begin to see there's really no comparison. So mindfulness is what re keeps reminding you of the lessons you've learned from your past actions. Alertness is what keeps watch for what's actually happening right now. So you see the processes of the mind as they happen. See the point where the mind abandons responsibility and just goes with unskillful thoughts. And then you see also the connection between acting on an unskillful motivation and the suffering that comes as a result of the action. You've got mindfulness and alertness working together. Your choices and decisions get better and better informed. And when you've learned to associate them with this sense of ease and well-being, they get stronger within the mind. So as we're working with the breath, these are the qualities we're trying to develop. Just keep the breath in mind, that's mindfulness. And then watch the breath, be sensitive to the breath, how it feels in the different parts of the body. That's alertness. Once you've got a sense of ease going with the breath, then you can try exploring how the breath feels in different parts of the body. Make a survey. Start at the navel, go up the front of the body section by section, then go over the head, through the head, down the back, out the legs. Start again at the back of the neck, go down the shoulders and out the arms to the tips of the fingers. In other words, work through the body section by section to see what rhythm of breathing, breathing feels best for that part of the body. 
there's any sense of tension or tightness, you can allow it to relax, and then move on to the next section and then the next. Keep this up until you're ready to settle down, then choose any one spot in the body that seems most congenial. Focus your awareness there and then think of it spreading out from that spot to fill the whole body. This way you strengthen your powers of mindfulness, you strengthen your powers of alertness, and give yourself a good, solid place to stay so, you're, so that you don't get knocked over by greed, anger, and delusion, so they don't lure you out. Lure you out in front of a car, or lure you out to be kidnapped. You're creating a home for the mind, and it's a good home. A home where you don't feel confined, a home where you're happy to stay. And the good part about this home is you can take it wherever you go. After all, the breath is always there. Simply, up, it's up to us to focus on it or not. When you learn to associate the breath with a sense of ease and well-being, a sense of fullness, you can even get a sense of rapture, simply being with the breath and allowing it to feel full as it comes in and maintain that fullness even as the breath goes out. In other words, don't squeeze it out too much. Try to maintain a fullness in the breath energy throughout the body. And that way the idea of acting on skillful intentions becomes more attractive because there's an immediate sense of well-being that comes with it. All too often the choice in our minds is immediate gratification through acting on unskillful thoughts, or delayed gratification working on the skillful ones. And if that's the choice, the skillful ones often lose out. The mind is hungry if it wants something right away. It's going to go for whatever offers the quickest quickest fix. But if you can learn to associate mindfulness, alertness, concentration, all these good qualities with a sense of fullness and ease in the body, then the skillful side gets the upper hand, because it offers not only immediate pleasure of a more refined kind, but also long-lasting pleasure. That way the desire to always do the most skillful thing gets more and more established, more solid. When it's established and solid, then you have your protection. Your home is the home that's built out of brick, not the one that's built out of straw or sticks. The wolf comes and it can't blow it down. So you've got a whole hour to work on this home. Make it comfortable. Stick with it as much as you can. Because it provides a sense of protection, it provides an alertness and mindfulness that can last well beyond the hour. 